After receiving a range of diagnoses as a child, he was diagnosed with autism as an adult. He went on to becoming a researcher, receiving his PhD in psychology. He is internationally known and respected for his work in the field of autism. A writer and poet, he has written numerous books and articles on autism. He has presented at numerous conferences and led workshops on autism and Asperger's syndrome around the world. A recipient of the Victorian Australian of the Year, he is committed to making neurodiversity the norm and creating a world where individuals on the spectrum can thrive in safety and in peace. Let us welcome Wen Lawson who will speak on autism, sexuality and gender. Thank you. I just wanted to say I'm not used to this environment. I have cards to follow and something to look at and a clicker. And as an autistic person, um, that's a lot to process. I've been told it's a lot to process for anybody, uh, which I suppose is meant to be encouraging. So thank you for your patience with me. On the slides that you can see behind me, there's some pictures. Um, I think every person on those slides is on the autism spectrum including the magpie. Can you see the bird? Just say yes, talk to me. Yeah. Um, this is an Australian magpie and um, he comes every day at a particular time to be fed. He likes structure and routine and if I'm not there to feed him, he taps on the window. He's uh, very autistic um, and we love him, but just in case you were worried about why a bird was in the picture. That's one of the reasons. My brother is in the picture standing next to me. He's the tall guy with a kind of a black top. And I've got a blue shirt on. I was saying to Jackie yesterday, I didn't get the tall jeans. I'm the shortest person in our family. And uh, she said that that's probably an asset in lots of places because Jackie's very tall. You can see Temple Grandin in one of those pictures. She's uh, an American autistic lady um, that I've often lectured with and uh, taught with and I liked the fact that she liked my tie. So I put her in there because ties are also a bit of a passion for me. My mum, you can see Dan standing with me when I was younger, much younger, in my blue top. She died just a couple of weeks ago and um, there's a lot going on in me still from that loss. So again, I thank you for your patience. Uh, we're talking about gender. We're talking about the differences as autistic people between male and female. I'll talk later, and the next time that I talk, on more of my personal journey where gender is concerned. Who am I? A question that lots of us will ask. When looking out upon the world, I see, as any might, the things I notice, boy or girl, are captured within my sight. When looking out upon the world, I feel, as any might, my heart can hurt, ache or break, my senses heightened, set or curled, I live through day and night. I'll just check that I got that right. <laughs> But as you look in upon my world, your head might judge, your eyes not see the true reality that makes up me. And this is true for all of us, eh? Flesh and bone of body image may not make the man. The clothes I wear may cause a stare. My choices may confuse. But what if she is not I am? What if he is not a man? This binary world imposed is set by those who propose male and female is set in time when reality says there's not one line. That might be a challenge for some of us, but I wanted to read that to you. Got a point up there. Gender and sexuality are very different things. Sometimes the forms in Australia that I have to fill in will say, sex, it will say name, date of birth, sometimes address, and sex. 
and this is me going to be a little bit naughty, because when I read that, I want to say, yes, please. <laughs> You're supposed to laugh, but that's okay. Some of you did. When they say sex, what do they mean? Gender, yeah. They mean gender, because they're actually different things. And gender is very much a spectrum. Autism is very much a spectrum. Sexuality also is very much a spectrum. Point up there. I've said that already. If you're an autistic person, you're very single-minded. You're very likely to be focused on things that are of interest to you as an individual. And sometimes people will say things like, and it certainly was said to me when I was growing up, oh, he, she, they can do it if they want to. Implying that if they don't do something, it's because they don't want to, and that that's a choice. Very often in autism, it's not a choice at all. It's the way our brains are actually wired. We're put together to be single-minded people. Sometimes people talk about us as being very black and white in our thinking. Sometimes they say we're very logical. I don't think those are bad things. It can mean there are difficulties, though, when you have to do things that are more in those greyer areas, things to do with social interaction with other people. I'm just going to put these cards down. Can you cope? Yes. Oh. Somebody has spent a lot of time making those for me. Got to stand in this square. But they were getting a bit heavy. All right. So separating issues, things that are to do with social, public, private, and all those sorts of things can be quite difficult for autistic people who are very single-minded. Um, how do we know which is which? Where do I take my clothes off? Am I allowed to take them off when I go swimming? Am I allowed to change my clothes when I'm moving from day clothes to night clothes? Do I take my clothes off when the doctor wants to examine me? Do I take my clothes off when an adult tells me to? When, where, how often, who with, all those sorts of questions are quite difficult for those of us on the spectrum. They're things we have to learn. Although it's very important to talk about independence, I've actually been rather too independent at times. And to take independence a step further, we should be talking about interdependent, learning to ask, learning to share. Those sorts of questions, those ideas, have taken me a long time to understand. I used to do my own thing because I didn't really understand what other people wanted from me. So learning to be independent was probably something I had too much of. Learning to be interdependent has taken me longer. Being female and autistic, I have two or three, probably, two definitely, diagnosed autistic granddaughters, and one that I've always talked about as being not on the autistic spectrum. We're beginning to change our mind. She's actually... Um, got an appointment for an assessment now. Being autistic and female is very poorly understood. But is being female and autistic rare? And the answer is no. We used to say things like, hmm, one to four, one female to four males would be diagnosed as somewhere on the autism spectrum. These days we're saying it's probably either one to two or it's the same ratio. It's just that the presentation of girls on the autism spectrum is quite different, so we, we often miss them. <laughs> Point to the back. Oops, gone too far. That's all right. Females differ anyway, whether they're autistic or no, just as men do. There are females who are very girly and frilly, and um, am I allowed to say that? Pardon? Oh, thank you. That's all right then. Lots of girls like pink. Did you know this? Do all girls like pink? No. Do all girls like wearing frilly things and sparkly things? No. 
because some girls are more at the other end of the girly or female spectrum and they're quite what we might call, at least in Australia, tomboys. Have you heard of that one? They're rough and tumble, adventurous, but very much girls. Very much girls. So there's quite a wide spectrum just in the femaleness of, of women anyway. Just keep doing this. All right, too far. Back. Oh dear. Gonna need help, I think. Ask me. Sorry, I, I've got to go back to the big slide. I've pressed it too many times. Oops. I'm glad that the song started off about love. That's helpful, isn't it? Say yes. Oh, gee. I was getting worried for a minute. Go back. I'm way out of this square because I'm trying to read that. Is that where I am? Am I on the right spot? Okay. Ah, all right. Did I speak about that already? All right, I didn't. So when we look at girls who often do go on to get a diagnosis of autism, we sometimes say things like, they're really good at communicating so they can't be autistic. This is at that what we call high functioning end, and I, I don't like the expression. Um, it makes it sound like, no, anyway, it's horrible, but never mind. Can you cope? Oh, please talk to me. Yes, thank you. Um, when I think of something functioning, I think of washing machines. And if you think of high functioning, it makes it sound sort of automated and strange and low functioning where those washing machines don't work at all. So you better not invest in one of those. Is that right? Say yes or you can say no if you wish. Okay. So the differences between high and low functioning really are very unclear and difficult. We're talking about people, we're talking about kids, teenagers, adults who are living on the autism spectrum. And we all function differently. And females will function very differently too, but if they're very able, as you know, women have what we call double X chromosome. Have you heard of that? Oh, thank you. And that double X chromosome is likely to mean that um, girls are going to be good at copying, girls are going to be good at um, pretending. Do you have swans in India? You have ducks, eh? I've seen ducks. Can you see them paddling under the water? Only if the water's very clear, I think. But on the top, they look like they're just floating along, don't they? Say yes. Yes. Girls are like that sometimes, especially if they're autistic. They're fighting madly underneath the water to stay on top of things. And they're not succeeding very well, because as things get more demanding and as life gets uh, a bigger hold, and it's demand on their attention. As they get older, they have to paddle more. And at some time in their lives, that can break down. I forgot about the slide. I have to move them on. I think I'll have to have the clicker back, because, sorry, it's too hard to... Yeah, I... I was probably sent so that I'd, we'd, we'd have it all very different than you're expecting can't hit myself because I've got a thing on. Um, so they'll say things like, girls are too social to be autistic. Um, she might have friends. Um, she might look at me, have good eye contact when they're speaking. These are things that people have used to judge whether somebody's on the spectrum. I'm really pleased that we have something called the DSM-5. Have you heard of this? It's a diagnostic, well, you're talking to me, this is good. The diagnostic manual for various ailments, and it has a list of things that it sees as representing how uh, the characteristics of autism. There used to be three in the older DSM, and people called this the triad of impairments, horrible term. When I think of triads, I think of Asian people dressed up who are going to beat me up. Never mind. Okay, you don't pretty watch too many science fiction movies like me. But the triad of impairments already puts somebody way down as impaired and uh, lots of difficulties. 
I'm really pleased that the climate is changing in the world of autism and we're focusing more on what, we people, what people can do. Focusing more on strength and ability rather than on impairments. And the DSM-5, instead of having those I mean, three areas of difficulty, has reduced it to two. Better not swear at you. Is that all right, that one? Is that one allowed? Yes, I can't see you very well, so it's hard to tell. Two areas of difficulty. And one of those is called restricted interests. Now, if we change that term and refer to it in a different way, and we think of it as passions, because that's what it is, really, then we're going to think about autism very differently. And I like this aspect to the new DSM. And girls can be very passionate. Passionate about reading, passionate about animals, passionate about mathematics and science, passionate about all sorts of things, and possibly passionately quiet about those things too. Uh, boys on the spectrum... <laughs> all right, okay. Boys on the spectrum, because of their XY chromosomes, tend to be a little bit, they, they've got more, they've got testosterone, we've all got testosterone, but boys have more of it, you know this, don't you? Say yes, yes. Come on, we've got three days together, all right? Uh, and what does testosterone do? It does lots of things, but it can mean that boys may be a little bit more out there. Is that a good way of putting it? Pardon? Yes. And girls, tend to take things inside themselves, don't they? So girls are candidates for mental illness, more so than the boys. Girls are candidates for being not so noticed about things that are happening for them. These are some of the differences that you'll see. Can't, cope, can't read this very well, but these are some of the differences you'll see when it comes to autism. And because they don't show so well, Girls aren't noticed so easily, they're not picked up so quickly with some of the difficulties that they have. Now, these are gender differences, but we need to be listening. And we need to be looking because the girls do need our support and attention. Uh, <laughs> okay. Girls will ask lots and lots of questions and even some of the answers you give them won't necessarily doesn't satisfy. It's very hard when you can't actually get your head around how those things come together. So even an answer doesn't feel like an answer. And they keep going quite often with their questions. And I'm, I'm thinking of my granddaughters in particular, um, how hard it is to process things for young people on the spectrum. And they're constantly wanting to put the bits together now, if you've got a brain that's wired to be single-minded, how are you going to put the bits together? With great effort, is the answer. If you're not on the autism spectrum, you'll be wired up to process things in a kind of wider picture. Sometimes I think of you guys, if you're not autistic, not everybody can be autistic. Some of us get to be that privileged, others are not. But we are on the increase, you know this, don't you? They're saying it's like one in 58 kids are somewhere on the autism spectrum. So we will take over the world one day. Just preparing you. Just preparing you. So I think of neurologically typical people or non-autistic people as operating on a very wide beam of a torch, taking in lots of information. But if you're not autistic, you operate on that very narrow beam. So your information that you're taking in is pretty intense, but very single focused. But it means you're going to miss that wider understanding. Some of the good things about this when it comes to gender and sexuality is we're probably less influenced by what other people think. We're probably more honest as autistic people we say what we think. We're not so connected socially about what we're supposed to do, which can mean we can be inappropriate. Do you understand this? Yeah. 
Now, it's not that we're meaning to be inappropriate, but we don't have the connection to what you should do, where, when, who with, how often, and these kinds of things. So gender is often more fluid. That's a strange word. It just means less set. Uh, that term binary that I, s I used in that poem is about when things are set, they're binding, they're lasting. But in autism, gender and sexuality, just like autism, very often change over time. They're not as set as they are in the typical world. Um, okay, so in autism we may not notice or be aware. We may not even actually comprehend some of the things that we're not putting together. <laughs> oh dear. Wherever we are as autistic people, I'm going to be single-minded, I said that already, gender is often not well understood. And I don't mean necessarily by us our, our, um, alone, but also by the wider community. We're so set, this is male, this is female. It was nice hearing that the place where I'm standing and this state is, is not patriarchal. It's more matriarchal and there's an explanation given which I didn't really take in. But it meant, and we shouldn't be either really, should we? Should we? No. We want equality, don't we? But equality is something you have to fight for sometimes, isn't it? And it's hard to put those two things together. All right. Just like recognizing autism, AS, the autism spectrum, we need to recognize individual gender, individual sexuality. I think I've got to move on quite quickly because I've probably had time. Um, I'm going to talk more about gender dysphoria later. Gender dysphoria is when a person's gender or sex characteristics they were born with and they were given a name as this is a boy, this is a girl, um, doesn't marry, doesn't fit with how they feel about themselves. And again, this is quite hard in autism because we have lots of sensory things. I certainly do anyway. As in the sensory um, world that I live in can be quite overwhelming, too bright, too loud, um, seemingly all coming at me at once. So how do I separate the sense that I have about my gender. Can I be really bold? Yes or no? Yes? If you sit to pee as a female, you're probably not that aware of how urine smells. If you stand to pee as a male, four, fragrance hits you. If you're on the spectrum, this could be one of those small reasons why kids find it difficult to be toilet trained. Just the way things smell. Does that make sense? The way things taste when it comes to food, all of these things impact on how we perceive the world. It's quite different because we're operating on that very narrow beam. We're not connecting to the wider thing. Things aren't diluted in the same way. So not being comfortable with the gender that you were assigned with is actually seemingly more common in autism. So that word dysphoria means a split or a separation from the comfort of the gender you were said to, to be. And I'm gonna talk more about that later. Um, typical gender, typical sexuality, typical autism even, there is no such thing. You know that, don't you? Pardon? Yes. Oh, good. I think you do. Learning to let go of our prejudice and notice an individual's separate expression of who they are is very important. I think it's not easy, but it's very important. Teenage years, depression, suicide, mental illness, these are often linked, and in particular are linked to gender and sexuality issues in autism. And we need to be aware, prevention is always better than cure. When someone's killed themselves, there is no cure. It's too late then. So we need to be listening. So I've probably gone over my time. Just some 
um, homepage information, uh, places to look, as well as telling our own stories to each other. Stories are about life and we need to be sharing in those stories. Because without the story that you have and the story that I have, we have nothing to compare. We have no model or way of knowing. So we need to be talking to each other. And in autism, sometimes talking is not the best way, but presenting story doesn't have to be in speech. It can be in picture. I'm a person who loves technology, so videos and photos mean a lot to me. And YouTube and Google are king in my life about lots of information that I need to understand. And it's quite common in autism that we go towards technology to find answers for things. Now that has all sorts of problems, I know that. We need to monitor what, pe what little people especially are watching and looking at. But we still need to work with whatever is our particular learning style, the way that we learn. Um, I probably should end there. Thank you very much.